Things that are considered better or more important than they really are include college education, Instagram influencers, and some iconic cars, too. Hello, everyone. I'm Stipe, and these are the top seven most overrated cars ever. Oh, boy. Number seven. After 50 years on the market and 44 million cars sold, people are still buying these uninteresting cars like crazy. So why? Well, back in the 70s, American cars were sold with an average of 24 defects per piece. Needless to say, these cars were breaking down constantly, which was a real pain in the ass. And then Toyota showed up. Da -da -da -da! Their Corolla was cheap to buy, cheap to run, and most importantly, it was far more reliable than anything else on the market. For all those people who just need a car to drive them from A to B, which was like 99% of the population, having this peace of mind was more important than anything else. Corolla became an instant hit, and to this day it is revered as just a really good car. That's an amazing value for the money. But I'm not sure that Corolla is still the best pick today, not next to some Korean offerings. The quality on all modern cars has really stepped up, except for maybe Pigeon. So bang for the buck is where it's really at now. Kia Forte, for example, costs less, is better equipped, and as for reliability, in some markets, Kia offers up to 10 years or 100,000 mile warranty. If that doesn't convince you, I don't know what else will. Stipe was not paid by Kia to promote the Forte over Corolla. He simply believes it is a better choice, but Kia should send him some thank you money anyway. Number six. There's a saying, you can't consider yourself a true petrol head until you've owned an Alfa Romeo. This is because Alfa used to make proper driver's cars. Real wheel drive, gearbox in the back for better weight distribution, and a V6 that sounded so good people nicknamed it the violin. Even the poor reliability was adding to their charisma. You hated and loved them all at the same time. The Alfa Romeo Brera is nothing like that. There's no rear-wheel drive, so say goodbye to pulling off those nice power slides. The violin is also gone, and with the improved reliability, some of its soul is gone as well. Performance is nothing to write about either. The top model has all-wheel drive and 256 horsepower, but still, it'll struggle to go under 7 seconds to 60. Audi TT is much faster. Anyway, at least it's drop-dead gorgeous, right? But so is the 159 too, which makes the Brera feel a little less special for it. And who are these people who say that the interior looks nice? Look at that dashboard. As if they had a blank area and a bunch of standardized elements, so let's try to fit them all in one place, right? Honestly, it reminds me of this. Simply put, Brera is not the new GTV6, no matter how much we all wanted it to be. Number 5. The Subaru Impreza STI is a legend. This rally car for the road is one of the most fun cars out there, precisely because its recipe didn't change for almost 30 years now. This means four-wheel drive and turbo noises. <laughs> yeah, baby! Yeah. However, new STIs go for around 40 grand these days, and many people think that's a bit too much when you consider the poor quality of materials you'll find inside. Not my words, but the words of customers who complained about it on Consumer Reports. The used car market makes even less sense, with the prices hanging unreasonably high. I say unreasonably because it's easier to find a Malaysian airplane than an STI that hasn't been molested. And let's not forget the engine. The 2.5 liter Turbo 4 makes all the right noises, but it is also woefully outdated. How else will you explain why the 911 Carrera 4 with an even larger boxer engine uses less fuel and produces less CO2? It's because the STI boxer unit is largely the same as the one they've used in the first car, which after 30 years of tweaking makes only 40 horsepower more at the most. Meanwhile, Mercedes is doing this. For how long will Subaru keep milking the rally heritage before people realize that STI has some catching up to do? Number four. Smart car is very popular in Europe because it's supposedly a very good city car, and it's a cheap way to get around. Both those claims are wrong. It is not a good city car. The 4.2 is so focused on being small that it completely forgot about being a car as well. Having a small trunk and just two seats is what you expect from sports cars, which are like jet skis for the road, not for something you would really use daily. 
Toyota IQ is, if you ask me, a much better choice. It is just 10 inches longer, but for that you get rear seats too, or a larger trunk if you fold them. Yeah, some European cities really have tiny streets, but will 10 inches really make a difference? And let's not forget the K cars, the real champions of big practicality in small packages. By the way, Toyota IQ has a better turning circle, just wanted to point that out. Smart is also quite expensive to buy, because it is marketed as some cool urban fashion accessory to go together with your colorful personality. It's priced as a fashion piece as well. Plus, the small engines need to be pushed hard in order to keep up with traffic, to the point where much larger cars have better MPG. In short, smart people don't buy smarts. Number 3. The G-Class is not even trying to hide its origins. It was a military vehicle. Rugged, dependable, and unstoppable. Add a bunch of luxury and power to the mix, and you have one of the most expensive cars Mercedes sells. So that means it's good, right? Nope, it's not as good as people say. It is luxurious, yes, but it can't rival those real Luxo SUVs like the Bentley Bentayga, or even the Mercedes GLS. Despite its size, it's not very roomy either. The military version is spacious, but put some giant sofas and lots of gizmos inside, and you'll begin to feel a little bit cramped. The twin-turbo V8 makes a huge 580 horsepower, but because the G-Wagon is as aerodynamic as a brick, the top speed is limited to 130 miles per hour only. High center of gravity means that it doesn't like to corner either. At least it's good off-road, with a tall ground clearance, blocking differentials and all that grunt. The G63 is limited only by its tires. It'll get you far, but the Jeep Wrangler with the proper chunky tires will get you further. So let's stop pretending that the G is something extraordinary. It's just an overpriced status symbol for city people who desperately want to feel notorious or something. Like, look at me, I'm a badass. Sure, buddy, whatever you say. Number two. The fourth gen Supra is amazing. I mean, who doesn't like this over-engineered Japanese brute that's able to smoke a Ferrari even in its stock form? But the way some people talk about it, there's just too much hype going on. The main culprit for all of this is the Fast and Furious movie where an orange target top Supra decimated everything on the road after just 15 grand worth of upgrades. This will decimate all after you put about 15 grand in it. Keeping up with a charger that's able to pull a wheelie was an unforgettable sight for many easily impressionable teenagers, myself included. It was our first look into a world of cool, modified cars and drag racing where 1,000 horsepower Supras were just killing it. Yeah, such cars do exist, but it's not all fun and thrills. More like pain and bills. The 2JZ engine has an incredible tuning potential, but to triple its power, it'll take more than just increasing the boost, and much more than $15,000. Nevertheless, the Supra turned into an icon, which is why these days unmodified cars with low mileage are being sold for over a hundred grand. That is insane. I love the Supra, but for that sort of money, I love other cars more. Number one. Tesla is like Apple, being an innovative force that's reshaping the industry, but also forming what is almost a religion, a cult following of Elon Musk and Tesla cars. And as with every religion, many lies are being sold as truth. Like the whole thing that electric cars will save the planet. They won't. All of transportation on land, sea, and in the air account for just 14% of the CO2, which means that personal cars are an even smaller slice. And just because Teslas have no tailpipe, it doesn't mean that you aren't causing any pollution. The tailpipe was simply moved to the power plant. The batteries are also hard to recycle. And besides, all EVs have this giant problem called range anxiety. Slow recharging times and a shortage of charging stations means that you'll forever have this anxious feeling of running out looming over you. I think that hybrids are a much better choice because they bring the best of both worlds. Wouldn't you agree? And let's not forget the infamous build quality. Being a startup company means that Tesla has a lot to learn, like how to produce a well-made car in a very short time. There are pages and pages of people complaining about poor panel fitment, bad paint finish, as well as things just failing to work. What's weird, as soon as it seems like they got a hand of it, the very next year the quality drops again. So how can you know what you're going to get then? All right, let's add three other overrated cars to make this an even 10. Can you recognize them? Do you recognize them? 
write down in the comments and also what topic should be next. Vote by clicking here. And cut!